Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze a presentation example for post-traumatic stress disorder? Specifically, can I look at an example where the trauma did not seem to be congruent with the development of the disorder? So another way of putting that is the trauma didn't really seem that severe when it happened yet it still led to post-traumatic stress disorder. So when I use the term presentation example, what I'm talking about is a situation where a mental health therapist, like a counselor, wants to take the information from a client's case, from a client's presentation, and produce a report from that. So this is also called a presentation analysis, case analysis, or a case study. After the clinician obtains consent, they produce this report, but they change a lot of the identifying information. Not only the client's name, but a lot of other information. But the idea here is that the clinical essence of the case remains unchanged. So we can learn something from it as clinicians and as people that are not clinicians, but we still don't know who it is, right? It doesn't have identifying information about the client. Typically, these are used in training, other types of education, conferences, and sometimes these case reports are published. The presentation example I'm using here did come from a published study, and I'll put the reference to this article in the description for this video. This is an interesting presentation example. It's of an eight-year-old boy. I'll call him Joe. This takes place in the United Kingdom. This is a good example of how a traumatic event might not seem severe, but how it's the interpretation that can lead to post-traumatic stress disorder. It's also a good example of how trauma-focused cognitive therapy can be used to treat post-traumatic stress disorder. One of the mysteries of post-traumatic stress disorder is why does it tend to form in some people who have relatively minor events occur when it might not form in other people who have really serious events occur, right? So for example, a severe motor vehicle accident compared to a minor motor vehicle accident. And that's what we're talking about here in this case, a minor motor vehicle accident. What we learn here, of course, is it's not just the severity of the traumatic event that matters. There are a number of other factors that have to be weighed in. Genetic factors, environmental factors, prior experiences, cognitive processing, and what was perceived during the event. So first I'll review Joe's history, then take a look at trauma-focused cognitive therapy, and then look at the course of treatment in this case. So again, Joe is eight years old. He lives with his father and two older siblings. Joe's father takes care of the three children alone, as his wife left him many years ago. Joe's father has a physical disability, but no history of mental health conditions. Now taking a look specifically at the traumatic event, I mentioned it was a minor motor vehicle accident. We see that Joe was riding home as a passenger in the front seat of his father's car. His father was driving. They were coming back from soccer practice and his father entered into a traffic circle. In this case, it was a five-way intersection. The father slows down as he sees another vehicle in the circle. So he has to yield to that vehicle because the other vehicle has the right of way. And as the father slows down, the vehicle behind him runs into the rear of his vehicle. The guy behind him was driving too fast, not paying attention, whatever was going on there but again, he drove into Joe's father's car. So Joe was not hurt at all. Joe's father sustained a minor injury to his knee because it hit the steering column. There was no airbag deployment. The vehicle was only cosmetically damaged, and it was drivable immediately after the collision. Evidently, when Joe's father exited the vehicle to talk to the driver that hit them, an argument ensued, and the other driver threatened Joe's father with physical harm. So Joe's father got back into the vehicle and drove away from the scene, but the other driver pursued them before eventually breaking off the pursuit by pulling over on the side of the road. Joe's father waited till they arrived home before he called the police. Shortly after this event, Joe was taken in to receive mental health care. He presented with intrusive memories of the accident and the subsequent pursuit. He did not seem to understand the incident, but he did understand that there was an accident and the car was slightly damaged and he also understood that the other driver chased him and his father. Joe would become very anxious when presented with anything that reminded him of the accident, the stretch of road where it occurred, 
stories on television related to car accidents, the type of vehicle that hit them, and talking about the incident. Joe had trouble sleeping. It took him a few hours to get to sleep, and he had to go sleep in the same room as his dad to fall asleep. He also had a lot of nightmares. He became physically aggressive in school and at home. At school, he was engaging in outbursts in the middle of class. There was one incident where he turned over tables and threw trash all around the classroom. And apparently this was pretty frightening to the school staff and to his fellow students. At home, he was fighting with older siblings and was set off by the slightest provocations. In addition to meeting the criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder, Joe had significant comorbidity, including oppositional defiant disorder, conduct disorder. It's really uncommon that both of those diagnoses would be given. He also had major depressive disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, separation anxiety disorder, and one specific phobia, spiders. The only diagnoses that were of concern before the incident would be the ADHD and the fear of spiders. All the other diagnoses were given after the event. That's a lot of mental disorders to be diagnosed with that quickly. I'll talk about this a little later. Specifically with the post-traumatic stress disorder, we see Joe had symptoms of hyperarousal, avoidance, and intrusive thoughts. He also had a disorganized understanding of the event and didn't really seem to be able to discuss the incident. So now I'll take a look at the trauma-focused cognotherapy. A key concept of this therapy when talking about PTSD is the nature of the traumatic memory. Not so much what happened, but again, the properties of the actual memory. It's considered to be critical to the development of PTSD. Individuals with PTSD often struggle to retrieve information about the event. When they do recall information, it's often fragmented and disorganized, as I mentioned. This is something, of course, we see specifically in this case with Joe. Another important concept is the idea of maladaptive appraisals. So an individual with PTSD is unable to accurately assess the event and the idea that the event was time limited. So they don't really understand that the event is in the past, that it's over. This leads to the sense that there's some sort of current threat, right? Again, so the traumatic event is not just in the past, but it's happening right now in some way, or it may happen right now in some way. To address these concepts and the other factors we see around PTSD, trauma-focused cognitive therapy focuses on the three M's of PTSD. Memories, distorted memory representations, meanings, the maladaptive cognitive appraisals, and management. This is working on the difficulty we see with coping with feelings and thoughts and perceptions. So now moving to the course of treatment we see in this case of Joe. The treatment team explained to Joe how the treatment was supposed to work. So they explained the three M's and all the other information about trauma-focused cognitive therapy. We see that Joe's father joined him for the early sessions. This kind of makes the client more comfortable. In the case of Joe, it certainly did. These initial sessions had a lot of normalizing of the response to the event. So anybody would be distressed if they were in a car accident and pursued by the person that hit them. There was a lot of rapport building. They made it clear to Joe that he had permission to talk about the event, which I think seems particularly important in this case because, again, he had difficulty really expressing thoughts or feelings around the incident. They also gave him permission to talk about the symptoms, and they discussed the incident in a calm and safe way, kind of setting a tone for Joe to follow, trying to really make this a little bit less emotional for Joe. Joe was encouraged to recognize his emotions, to express his emotions, and to manage the more extreme emotional reactions. Some relaxation techniques were used, including progressive muscle relaxation. Joe was also instructed to practice this at home, so we see some homework assigned, which is actually fairly common for all different types of cognitive therapy. We see this specific cognitive distortion was identified early on. This is that Joe believed that the world was a different place since the accident in relation to him, right? So he didn't fit in with the world in the same way because of that accident. Joe was assigned a number of new activities. This is called behavioral activation. Essentially, we see a series of tasks that Joe and his father would complete together. For example, they would play soccer in the garden, then in the street, and then play soccer in the park. 
The idea here was they're trying to move Joe into other geographic areas and increase the probability of contact with his friends. From these behavioral activation exercises, it became clear that one of Joe's fears was that when he was away from his father, something bad would happen to his father. To alleviate this fear, they discussed with Joe how his father had actually been in a number of altercations before this incident. They tried to sell this like Joe's father had a lot of skill at surviving fights, so it always worked out okay for him because he knew how to take care of himself. I'm not sure I would have gone with this route, right, like telling Joe that his father had been in a lot of fights and kind of was a survivor. That seems a little unusual to me. It's kind of introducing new information that may have backfired. But we see in the case report that this appears to have been effective. Again, maybe not something I would have done, but a kind of maneuver that seemed to work in this case. Joe also incorrectly believed that his father was still suffering from the injuries that occurred in the accident. What we see is that Joe became more alert about behaviors his father already engaged in. For example, taking medication. The father already did this regularly, but now Joe noticed it and attributed this behavior to the accident. So Joe had a lot of blanks in terms of understanding what happened, and he tended to fill in those blanks with the worst case scenario. The treatment team kind of created a game for Joe to address this, making him the detective who is responsible to find evidence and fill in those blanks. So unlike that other technique of talking about all these fights that the father had been in, I think this technique makes a lot of sense. This one really, I think, kind of empowers Joe and allows him to use his creativity and critical thinking skills to solve problems that could help him move past these symptoms. So I really like this technique in particular. We see an example of some of the blanks that Joe had in terms of the narrative. Joe believed that immediately after the accident that him and his father were both severely injured. So severely, in fact, he believed they required immediate medical treatment. Because they did not receive treatment, Joe felt that there must be unresolved physical issues. So he believed that both him and his father had physical problems as a result of that accident, but really it was a cognitive distortion. They did not have any problems at the time that Joe was receiving treatment. So to address this, they talked with Joe about his understanding of what happened. And in the narrative, we see that behind the vehicle that hit Joe and his father, there was an ambulance. The ambulance crew saw the accident. Of course, they were right behind the vehicle to hit him, as I mentioned. But then they drove past the accident, drove around the circle, and came back to make sure that no one was injured to the degree where they would need transportation to the hospital. Joe remembers seeing the ambulance twice, which is, in fact, what happened. The ambulance passed their position again two times, going past them and then coming back. The presence of that ambulance led to this assumption by Joe that he would need to be hospitalized. Therefore, his injuries must have been serious. So again, we kind of see how these cognitive distortions play out. There was information that was accurately collected at the time by Joe, but incorrectly interpreted. The treatment team was able to spin this around and paint another narrative. I thought this was also a good technique. They said clearly it was unlikely that Joe and his father were severely injured, as evidenced by the ambulance crew seeing them and continuing on. So they really took the same information but interpreted it more accurately and in a way that was more helpful to treating Joe's symptoms. Joe made fairly good progress as a result of therapy. There was this distress scale that they used in therapy. It went from 0 to 10 with 10 being the most distressed. Joe initially reported a score of 10 when discussing the incident, but by the time he got to the end of therapy he was reporting scores of 0 during all parts of his narrative, not just the parts associated with low distress, but even the parts that had been associated with a high level of distress. My thoughts on this presentation example, this is an interesting case. We get to see, as I mentioned before, how severity may be important sometimes, but it may not be the most important thing for everybody. And it would also appear here that the altercation was as traumatic as the accent. So I think that's what's really interesting about this as well. We see this accent that was fairly minor, right? Joe was uninjured. But then we see this pursuit. And that, as a separate incident, could be quite frightening. And it's really, again, how somebody perceives that pursuit. I think most people would have been fairly alarmed when being chased by another car. But by the accident itself, I think most people would not have 
view that as traumatic. When these things combined for Joe, it did result again in the development of post-traumatic stress disorder. We're also left with the sense that if Joe didn't realize that they were being chased, he would not have been traumatized, right? So maybe the motor vehicle accident really wasn't enough to lead to PTSD, but it was his interpretation of that pursuit, which of course, as I mentioned, would have been scary to anybody, but if he was sitting there and didn't know about it, he may not have had any reaction to it. Now, there's not a strategy that comes from this. Of course, there's no way to really say, hey, let's ignore what's going on, right? Joe's father couldn't have just said, hey, nothing's really happening here. Let's not worry about it. He had to acknowledge what was going on, and he was probably scared himself. But again, it just points back to how important perception is. I mentioned before that it seemed like Joe was given a large number of diagnoses. I have to, in some sense, of course, defer to the people that treated him because they actually saw him and they put together this case report. But I can't help thinking that it may have been more useful to diagnose him just with post-traumatic stress disorder and treat that for a while, rather than stacking on a lot of diagnoses. The one that concerns me the most, of course, is that conduct disorder diagnosis. Conduct disorder carries a stigma because about a third of individuals diagnosed with it will go on to develop antisocial personality disorder. So I think I would have tried to avoid the conduct disorder diagnosis, especially because the oppositional defiant disorder was already diagnosed. As I mentioned before, it's unusual to have both of those diagnoses together. Usually it's just one or the other. Of course, somebody can technically be diagnosed with both, but again, this is somewhat unusual. And if you have the ODD diagnosis there, I don't really see the urgency to go ahead and move forward with conduct disorder. But again, that's just my opinion from reading the case report. There's a lot of information, of course, that would not be included there. Of less concern, but still somewhat troubling, is the diagnosis of major depressive disorder. This is an episodic disorder that has a distinct course to it. Somebody has a major depressive episode, then they usually recover some degree, and sometime later they have another major depressive episode, usually. Sometimes there's just one episode, but usually there's more than one. So this isn't something that we really think of as being associated with a traumatic event, like a traumatic event occurs, and then immediately after that we see major depressive disorder. This is a disorder where you would typically take a lot of time before making the diagnosis, watch somebody for a while, see if there's some sort of change in their mood, look at the level of depression and the level of some of the other symptoms associated with that disorder. So a little bit unusual, I think, to jump right to major depressive disorder as well. So we see kind of, I think, some unusual diagnostic behavior on the part of the clinicians. Not necessarily technically incorrect, but just unusual. I thought this presentation example overall, though, was excellent in demonstrating how trauma-focused cognitive therapy could be applied to a real-life situation, and how cognitive distortions were highly problematic for Joe, and addressing those distortions seemed to lead to a marked improvement. PTSD, in part, is driven by individual perceptions. It's what people think of those events that really matters, at least in some cases. So I know whenever I talk about topics like this, like post-traumatic stress disorder, and I look at these different presentation examples, there are going to be a variety of opinions. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comments section. They always generate a really interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found this presentation example on post-traumatic stress disorder and trauma-focused cognitive therapy to be interesting. Thanks for watching.